Well, if you were here with us last week or maybe jumped online with us, then you know that we began um, uh, a series that we also did last year called I Believe. Now, the, the title was the same, but content different. Um, but we're, we're doing this every year, really just taking the opportunity to talk about some things that are core essential to the Christian faith. Because that's, uh, you know, the more I do this, the more I, I realize that sometimes it's, it's the things that you assume people already know and understand that, that you kind of feel like you don't have to talk about all the time. And, and yet I, I just realized that, that these are so foundational that we can't miss it. And so at the very least, even if we can't, you know, sit and explain it and say it in so many words, I want us to be able to walk away from a series like this saying, I know I believe that. This is what I believe. And so we started this series last week um, talking about grace. And so this is the statement that we made. We said that we believe that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. This is something that's on our website. It's in our statement of faith. And it is something that Christians have believed for 2,000 years. It is core foundational. In other words, and you've probably heard that before. I mean, this is nothing brand new, right? Again, it's like, okay, that's simple. I've heard that. But what does that really mean? And so, um, but, but essentially we're saying that grace, grace is what has purchased our salvation. It has nothing to do with our goodness, with how good we are, with our actions, our activity, how nice and kind and loving and all of those things. The problem is, is we know that. Matter of fact, I bet some of us could have finished that statement had I just put a few words up there. Like we we just like, I know that. I know that. I've heard that all my life. I've got verses memorized about that. But the truth is, until we understand this better and better, until we get there, we won't fully be able to live in response to that. Does that make sense? And, and, it, and it also has something to do with how we relate to our Heavenly Father. And so this is, this is kind of the reason for a series like this, because you can only be truly changed and transformed by knowing who God really is, not who you think God is. Like actually knowing to the best of your ability who God is, what his characteristics are like, the way he acts, the way he moves, the way that he thinks about you and me, all of those things affect and impact how you relate to him. Isn't that true? And so the more accurate our understanding of who God is, the deeper and the more intimate our relationship with God. And so that's why we're doing this. And so, but, but this specifically is about God's grace. That in, in less, like we have, to, we have to settle this, okay? And this is kind of where we were last week, that it is only, only, only by God's grace that we're saved. Now, the reason that I think this is worth talking about is because I think a lot of us believe that, but we also have, at the same time, there's something in us that butts up against that and is thinking, "Mm, I know that's true. I know that's true, but are you telling me that nothing else has anything to do with this? Like, I mean, sure, like what's all the rest of this stuff for? You know, I mean, what, like the going to church, and I mean, surely my goodness, like, is a factor anyway. I mean, come on, like, go. I, I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to cuss less. I'm trying to be sweet and nice and kind and all those wonderful things. I mean, what about that? And reading my Bible and praying some. You're telling me, like, doesn't that give me, I mean, let's be honest, doesn't that give me a little advantage, like, at least over, like, you know, terrorists and serial killers? Right? I mean, surely it makes me a like, like, like I'm, I'm a step up. But the truth is, it is only, and we've got to settle this, only, only, only by God's grace that we can be saved. But we said that in order to really begin to get this, and this is where we were last week, you and I have to understand why we so desperately need God's amazing grace to begin with. And this is where we settled it last week. We said we need God's amazing grace because... When it comes to a relationship with God, there is no such thing as good enough. It is not your goodness, and it can never be any, like, it just cannot be about that. Your relationship with God is not, not, not at all based on how good you are. Settle that. Here's here's where it just naturally leads us to this week, though, because we hear that, and when we are finally confronted 
with our insufficiency, the insufficiency of our own goodness and our own activity and our own doing and our own striving, when we're confronted with that, we ultimately unknowingly ask the question, so then why try? What's the point? Why, you know, what's all this other stuff? Like, why do I have to do all this stuff? You're telling me like it has nothing to do with that? Well, guess what? The Apostle Paul knew that this would be a question that we would be asking. I referenced it a little bit last week. But he, go, you know, the first few chapters of, of Romans, of his letter to the Romans, chapters 1 through 5, he kind of spells it out. He's going through this whole process that mankind is just a, a broken mess, sinful. Our explanation is sin, not mistakes. It's sin. It's not, you know, you might have your theory as to what the problem is, the brokenness in the world and in you. Our explanation is sin. We call it what we believe it is, sin. And so that has separated us from God. And there's no, and then he says, but, it is, but we can know God, but it is only through grace. But then he says, so the natural next question, because I'm a human like you are, and I know what you're thinking. He says, so, so what shall we say then? What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? It's like he's saying, I know what you're thinking because it's what I was thinking too. It's like, well, why give it so much effort then? If it's, if it's all by grace and grace alone, then, then maybe if, if God's grace, the more of God's grace that's in the world, the more God gets the credit and gets glorified. So mm, it just stands to reason let me just go ahead and put a little more sin into the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, more sin, I need more grace. God gets more credit. That's kind of how we process. And of course, we, you know, it's like, ah, that's childish logic. Nobody's thinking that way. But I mean, that's, it's not what we would say necessarily. And maybe even like we wouldn't, um, like we wouldn't argue with God about that. It's like, but we kind of think that way, don't we? I mean, it's like, you know, it, it, it's as if we live our lives as if we can just, you know, get up in the morning and we live life however we want to. Even Christians, um, we, don't, we wouldn't say this again, but, but we just kind of live however we want to. And especially if we could just relieve that pesky guilt, like if we didn't have guilt, like it'd be awesome. And then live however you want to and, you know, just send the day away. And then, you know, at night before I go to bed or, you know, when I go to church or when I go visit a priest, I can just, I can receive forgiveness and ask for forgiveness. And, and, and then I just, I've, I've emptied out my sin bucket and then I can refill it the next day. It's like, that's stupid. That's so silly. <laughs> I would never do that. I would never suggest that that would be the thing. And yet the truth is, and you know this is true, there are so many Christians who wouldn't say that, certainly wouldn't say they would believe that, but then live their lives as if that's true. They live that way. You know, it's, it's like there, there's so many Christians out there who would say, now, I, God, I believe in you. I love you. I, I know that you can save me from sin, death, and hell. Like you are in control and it is all about you. Praise God for that. And then when the economy begins to tank and depending on who's in office, you know, who's in the big chair, it's like we begin to freak out as if God is so unaware of what's going on in the world. Or when it comes to our finances and our stuff and our things and, you know, the way that we live and we think, we, we pray, oh God, bless me, you know, give me the things that I need. I know that you're in control and you are my great provider. And then we struggle with giving unless there's a little bit of extra cash at the end of the month. Isn't that true? It, as if, you know, that's what mattered more. And, and the thing is, we don't even recognize that we're living that way. And yet, I promise you this, if you're not a Christian in here today or you're kind of like on the fence or maybe you're watching online at some point this is one of your hang-ups this is one of the reasons that you have trouble taking christianity seriously because you don't see any difference that being a christian makes in the lives of christians you don't see like their life doesn't look that much different to you it's like you look around and it's like i hear what they say and they say they believe all of this but then you know, the only difference in their life and my life is that they make themselves get up on Sunday morning and they go to church. But honestly, they don't even look like they enjoy it all that much. So like, that's the difference. Like that doesn't make a difference in their life. And I don't see any, you know, they, they're as scared as I am that the economy is, you know, on the brink of disaster and that 
you know, China this and, you know, North Korea this and, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it is, it's, it, I don't see any difference in, in how they apply their so-called faith. And so I don't really want anything to do with that. And here's the thing. I would say to you, to those of you online or in the room, I'd say you are right. It shouldn't be that way. In fact, it should be way, way better. It's way better than that. There's so much to it, and we're missing it. And so today, I, I want to ask the question, I want to ask the question, what does grace actually accomplish? Okay, because I think we stop at kind of where we left off last week. You know, salvation is by by grace through faith alone in Christ Jesus, okay? And so, and, and essentially what we think of when we say, okay, what does grace do? It essentially only applies to what happens after we die. In other words, we would say, yeah, I agree with this. God's grace impacts where you go after death. That's one of the things it accomplishes. Grace, it buys me my way into heaven because, you know what? That's the better alternative. If there is a heaven after death, if there is something, if there's life after death, then doggone it, I want to make sure that it's like a good version of that. And so we're, we're you know, we recognize that, but that's not all. It's so much better than that because here's what I want us to, to see today is that God's grace also impacts how you live and experience the life you have here right now it should anyway like it's not just what happens after death grace grace it impacts the life that you live and experience like right now here and now and here's the way that the apostle paul explains it chapter six is where we just were a second ago chapter six it is one of my favorite, if, if I had to pick a chapter, okay? Now, I love Philippians as a whole, just the, the, the letter that he wrote to the Philippians and what he was going through when he wrote it, but there's something about Romans, especially the first 11 chapters of Romans that just, it gets my nerdiness going, you know what I'm saying? And my wife isn't here to laugh at me, and so I'm really glad about that. Um, but I love to think about these things because if you take any section out of Romans and read it by itself, it will make no sense because then you'll read something else and it's like, see, that is completely the opposite of what, he just, what I just read. You have to read it all together. You have to read it collectively and you have to begin to put those, I mean, it takes some, you know, you really got to put your thinking cap on. And so I want to do my best. We're going to begin in, in chapter six, but verse nine. And he is explaining what grace actually has accomplished for you and for me, okay? Here's the way he explains it. He says, for we know, talking to Christians here, okay? If you're not a Christian, you're getting to listen in on a conversation we're having with ourselves. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, because that's what we believe, he cannot die again. He's just making an argument, you should already believe this. It's like, uh, I'm a Christian, so I believe that, that Christ died and that he was raised from the dead. Okay, so I believe that, which means he cannot die again. Well, why is that? Because death no longer has mastery over him, his physical body, who he is. Like, he can't die again. He died, and then he was raised to life, which means he conquered death, and because death has been conquered, he can't die again. Fantastic. The death he died, he died to sin. It wasn't just a physical death. He died to sin, and this, this obedience, the sacrifice that, he's, that he made, was sufficient for all. This one time, this one instance, this one moment in human history when Jesus died and then was resurrected and brought back to life, which is what we believe, it's what we're celebrating in a few weeks, that means he died to sin once for all, and it was sufficient for all. It wasn't just for himself. But the life he lives, he lives to God, which means that you and I have been identified with Christ and the death that he died, but also the life that he now lives. This is the way Paul explained it. I've talked about this before. 
Um, and this is chapter five and, and a little bit earlier, but he talks about this relationship. He, he uses, you know, he's trying to create a word picture. He's saying, so when Adam and Eve, when Adam sinned, you know, at the beginning of time when everything was getting started, God created everything and then Adam separated himself from, from a relationship with God. And so everybody who has ever been born physically, which guess what, that includes you and me. Did you know that? Like physical birth, like we were born physically. We were born in Adam. In other words, everything that was true of Adam, the sin and the consequence of sin and the death that was going to be experienced has been applied to you and me. Now you've got your own theory. You know, if you're not a Bible person, you know, you don't believe, like, you may have your own theory as to what's wrong with the world. But this is our explanation. This is the way Paul's saying it, is that we believe that anybody born since Adam and Eve, which is everybody, was born with the same condition, a sin nature, okay? But for those, because of what Jesus did on that cross and being resurrected again, that the sufficiency of what he did on that cross, the sacrifice that he made, has been applied to you. So he's, he explains it this way. You've now been taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. And now you need to live as if that's true of you. So when you've been taken out of Adam and placed into Christ, the consequence is still there. It's like, yeah, I'm still going to experience physical death one day, but there is something that has been applied to me that is true of Christ as well. The conquering of sin and death. Not the consequences of it, but just its control over you. And so this is what he says. Paul says, so in the same way, in the same way as, as the way Christ experienced it, count yourselves. What does that mean? Consider it true. Believe this is true. Say it, claim it, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Believe that this is true of you. Now, this is the part we're kind of okay with. I mean, this is one of my, you know, all-time favorite verses. This is probably one of those, you know, that you've heard or maybe had memorized when you were young. But man, there's so much before this that we've got to realize, like, in the same way, in the same way what? Well, in the same way that... Christ died, but that he was raised to life and he conquered sin and death and he can no longer die again. That has been applied to you and to me for those who have been taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. It is for you and it is for me. So count yourselves. In other words, believe it. It's like, I don't know. Like, I don't know that I feel it. That's our problem. We, We see this and we just go to what grace has accomplished with our, you know, after death stuff, the heaven, the, you know, eternal life. And that's, you know, oh, I'm, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And that's where we, that's where we go. It's like have eternal life, have eternal, you know, it's like the one day, it's one day, but man, there's still a mess now. And I'm just living this life and it's miserable. And I don't know, and I'm broken and I'm still a mess. And they told me it would change my life, you know, and, and yet my life doesn't look that different. So Paul then gives the explanation of why that is. Why doesn't life look all that different? He said, so he's made the case. This is what you believe. It's by grace you have been saved through faith in Christ Jesus. And the death that he died and the light that he now lives has been applied to you. Therefore, what is true of Christ is now true of those who are in Christ. What is true of Christ is now true of those who are in Christ. In other words, when when we say death no longer has mastery over Jesus because he conquered sin and death, that means death no longer has mastery, in other words, it's not your master, any longer. Oh, really? Because, like, I feel mastered by it often. And that's what he's about to explain. He's saying, but it's not true. You can claim that it's not true. It's a, it's a shift in perspective. It's understanding this isn't just about what happens on, in, in the one day. This is like the here and now, that it is true of you. You've been set free. You, you have been placed into Christ, and so you can live alive. And you're no longer, it's, 
when once sin just owned you and you didn't really have a choice in the matter, now you have some say-so. You can choose this. Or not. And we need to get to a point where we say, I'm no longer going to live that way. And this was the thought I had. If you were here for our series at the beginning of the year, we called it Soundtracks. And we were talking about those, those thoughts, like we need to replace some of those negative broken soundtracks with true soundtracks. This is one of them I think would be worth memorizing. Sin no longer controls me. Sin no longer controls me. To be able to say that, can, can I just get us to repeat that together out loud? Let's try that. Sin no longer controls me. For those who are Christians and you've said, I believe in Christ and what he's done for me, let's try this. Sin no longer controls me. Can I, I want to hear it. Sin no longer controls me. What if that became your new go-to? Because here's the thing, you're going to walk out of here today and like in just a little bit, maybe even in the next few minutes, but certainly the next couple of hours, you are going to be tempted to sin. <laughs> Did you know that? I don't care how long you've been in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will be tempted to sin. And here's what I would suggest, okay? Because I mean, you, you, we're, we're just kind of dipping our toes in the water. And so, yeah, you may go ahead and do that. You may go ahead and flick off the person next to you as you're driving down the road. And so that's fine. I'm not telling you not to, okay? But here's what, I, here's what I want you to add to that. Before you do that, I just want you to say, sin no longer controls me. And then flip them off. <laughs> but just know you chose that. It wasn't because you were controlled by sin any longer. Do you see the difference? And then one day, it, it'll be like, well, if sin no longer controls me, and I can now choose not to do that, I wonder if maybe I just should choose not to do that. To choose to live that way. And here's how he says you do that. Therefore, based on all this, because of, What's true of Christ is now true of me, and I've been set free from sin, and sin is no longer my master. Therefore, therefore, in other words, this is what it's there for. Do not let, in other words, you know what do not let means? It means you and I have a responsibility. We have a role to play. I thought we were talking about grace, and it's all about grace, and it's all about what God does, and it has nothing to do with me. And as, you know, it's like, I can't do it on my own. And it's like, that's true. As far as your salvation goes, and as far as being set free from sin and death and from its mastery over you, you've been set free from that. But, but, this is what he says, listen, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. What? Now, see, this is one of those times. Does that not sound like the opposite of what he just said? Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Didn't he just tell me to consider myself dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus? Yep, he did just say that. It's because while you've been set free from sin, you can still choose it. Sin no longer controls you. But you can still say yes to sin. Can I get an amen? Isn't that true? Yeah, you've been set free, but now you just have a choice, and you can choose it, and we do it all the time, and we can choose to be bound by sin again. And I heard this analogy a long time ago, and I've shared it, and again, I've never checked the source of this, and like if this is actually true, but I shared it before, and I think it's super helpful. <clears throat> if any of you are like circus elephant trainers, you can verify whether or not this is true. But what I heard years and years ago is that the way that they would train an elephant to walk around that ring and, and be comfortable with that is at a very early age, when they were young, they would chain that, that elephant. Now, I'm sure, you know, PETA doesn't allow them to train this way anymore. But at the time, it was like they'd put a chain around their leg and chain the other end um, to a stake that was down in the ground. And then... All that, that elephant knew was to walk in that circle right there. That was its life. That's all it knew. It was bound. It was chained. And then it's, it, as it grew, all they had to do was remove that chain, and that elephant would continue to walk in that circle as if it was still chained, even though it's been set free. And how often do you see Christians living their lives that way? Once bound, 
by that that addiction, that lust, that lack of self-control, that selfishness, that tendency to gossip, the wanting to cheat just a little bit on your taxes or your, you know, to hold things back or to live in fear, whatever those things are, that's, that's who we once were. That's how we once lived because we didn't have a choice. But once we were taken out of Adam and placed into Christ, we've now been set free from that kind of living We've been set free from that sin and we're not bound by it or mastered by it anymore, but we can still choose to live in it. And even though we're not chained any longer, we continue that pattern of living and that pattern of behavior because that's what we're so used to, even though we've been set free and we're not chained, we're not bound any longer. So how do we do that then? Paul, and Paul continues. He says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And then he says, this is how you're going to do it. Do not offer. This is the do not let part in more detail. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Did you know that you can do that? That you can choose to offer the parts of your body as an instrument of wickedness. And some of you are thinking, you are so right. When I want to whoop my child, I want to offer my hand as an instrument of wickedness, you know? It's so easy to do. And so even as Christians, we know better. This is essentially what we're doing. We're essentially identifying ourselves with who we once were, not who we are now. You've heard this before. You are a new creation. You are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Maybe you've heard something like that before. Your identity is no longer with who you once were in Adam. You've been placed into Christ, and so your identity now is found in Christ. And yet, we choose all the time, even though we know that's true, we choose to identify ourselves with who we once were. And so we behave how we once behaved. True? I mean, you've seen this happen. Here, here's how you'll know if it's beginning to happen. If you ever find yourself, you know, saying, what's the big deal? Nobody's perfect. Like, come on. Like, it's just how I was raised. It was, you know, my parents did this to me. You know, I can't help it. Everybody struggles. When you start doing that, you are saying, I am choosing to identify with who I once was as if I'm bound to this as if I'm stuck in this lifestyle, as if I'm stuck thinking and living and breathing the way that I always have. Even though I've chosen to be identified with Christ and placed into Christ, I'm going to identify that way. And so it's as if we're saying, okay, you know, I know. God, sin, hey, sin, I know that I shouldn't look at that, but I'm going to give you my eyes in this moment. I know I shouldn't touch that, but I'm going to give you my hands. I know I shouldn't go there, but I'm going to give you my feet. I know I shouldn't think thoughts like that, but I'm going to give you my mind. I know I shouldn't listen to crap like that, but I'm going to give you my ears. We offer the parts of our body, of our actual body, as well as different areas and parts of our lives, and we offer it to sin as an instrument of wickedness, even though we're not identified by that any longer. But rather, and this is, the, this is where it, it's responsibility. This isn't just avoidance theory, okay? This isn't like, oh, just sin avoidance. Avoid sin, avoid sin. Put up walls, you know. I'm just supposed to be an avoider the rest of my life and separate myself from all of society for the rest. Like, that's avoidance. And he's saying, that's... That's part of the equation, but that's not all. Instead, rather, offer yourselves. In other words, it's not just the negative, the do not offer, but instead, on the positive, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought, as those, as if, as if this is your identity, as if this is true of you, as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every stinking part of yourself to him as instruments of righteousness. It's not enough to just avoid sin. It's not enough to just say, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. Don't look at that. Don't. I mean, you know how long that lasts. About a minute and a half. 
oh, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to, oh, I was tempted. I'm not going to, I'm not going to think those thoughts anymore. I'm not going to do that. And if that's all we're doing, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you'll end up slipping. But instead, if we begin to offer in its place every part of our body as an instrument of righteousness, I think that means to then turn around and to serve your heavenly Father with every piece of your being. Like, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to begin to pray for other people, to begin to go out of your way, to love on people, invite them to Easter, perhaps, to get them in a small group, to bring them to church, to serve them on a Sunday morning, to take them some food, to pray for them, whatever it is, to treat people better than yourselves. If they ask for your shirt, you take off your jacket and your shoes as well, and you just give it to them. In other words, this is going, it's choosing to just... Make your life a sacrifice, and when you begin to live that way, I'm telling you, it begins to change you. It begins to do something in you, and it's not immediate. It's not overnight, and yes, it's difficult, and you'll slip back into sin because you're still a sinner. Set free from sin, but still a sinner, as long as we're on this side of heaven. We're still living with the consequences of sin and death, but we're not bound by it. We're not a master, we're not a slave to it. It is not our master any longer. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. We learned last week to be under the law simply means this. It means you just simply recognize that you're a mess and that you're broken. To live under the law just means living full of guilt. That's what that means. The law is there just to show you that you don't measure up that there's no such thing as good enough. That's what the law does. Nobody wants to live under that because you'll just, you'll walk away at some point. It's like, "Ah, I just feel guilty all the time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to church. I'm not going to be around those people. I'm not going to say I believe that because I just feel guilty all the time. But guess what? You're not under the law. You're under grace. When you come out of Adam and you're placed into Christ, then you are under grace. Something new has happened. You have been given a new identity. You are no longer a slave to your former master. You don't have to identify with that any longer. It is not who you are. So live like it. And these are, for those of you who are Christians, okay, let me talk to you for just a second. I'm assuming that you've already stepped into a relationship with Jesus. That's what would make you a follower of Jesus, a Christian. And so this is what you need to be. I just want to give you three things. If you're not a Christian, we'll have to back up a step, okay? But for those of you who are Christians, these three things need to begin to happen. First, walk out of here here today claiming what is true. I am a new creation. I've been placed into Christ. What is true of Christ is now true of me. The life I once lived, it is gone. I now live a new life. Death is gone. I can now live. Like, I don't have to live in death any longer. I'm I'm done with death. I've had enough death in my life. Does anybody, I mean, can you say that? Like, I've just had enough death. Death of a marriage. Death of a relationship. Death of a career. Death of, what? I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done being bound by that. I'm no longer bound by that. I am in Christ. Claim that, it starts there, and then say no to sin. That has to begin happening. You do have a responsibility. You have a role to play. You are not, you're part of the solution not to save you. You're part of the solution, though, to live in freedom. So say no to sin. Stop offering the part. Yes, you're going to still fall and fail, and you're going to have temptation, and you're going to, but but begin to say what is true of you. I am no longer controlled by sin. I am no longer, make that your new soundtrack. I'm no longer controlled by sin. I still sin sometimes, but I'm not controlled by it. Like I'm just doing it. I'm no longer controlled by sin. And then offer your life to God. And every part of your life, it's not, a, you can't stop here. Say no to sin, say no to sin. I also need to offer my life to God. Now here's the thing. Every single one of us in here know what a difference 
one or two decisions can make in the, in, in the trajectory of our lives, the direction that our lives go. I bet, I bet if, if you and I sat down and we were swapping stories and you could begin to narrow down, some of you have done this before, you think back on different seasons of life and you can kind of narrow down to like one or two like not so good decisions when your life began to move in a different direction than you thought. You know, it's like, I, it was just that, I shouldn't have gone on that spring break. You know what I'm saying? You remember that spring break. I shouldn't have been in that relationship. I shouldn't have taken a sip of alcohol that first time. I, should, I remember the day it happened, and man, my life just began to move in a different... I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have made that bad financial decision. I shouldn't have done it. I made a decision... I made a few decisions, and it sent my life in a direction that I didn't expect, didn't want it to go. But I guarantee you, there are some of you in here who also have learned that the opposite is true, that one or two really good decisions can change all of that, can turn all of that upside down and send you in a different direction altogether. Begin sending you in a different direction altogether. It's not overnight. It's not immediate. But it will begin to move you in that direction to be able to live in that freedom. And I just want you to experience that. But it is not, it is not out of your hands and it's not enough to say, well, why try? It's all God's grace anyway. Because it's true. God's grace, not your goodness, makes you right with God. But on the other side of grace... When you experience that grace, on the other side of grace is both freedom, but also responsibility. Write it down, sock it away, don't ever forget it. It's not your goodness that sets you into a right relationship with God, your heavenly father. But you do have a role to play in the here and now. And you can live free. You've been set free, but it is our responsibility to choose to live in it, identified with what is true of Christ, to say, that is true of me. Sin no longer has mastery over me. Sin does not control me any longer. And I'm going to live in freedom. I'm choosing that. If you're here, though, and you're not a Christian, maybe you're listening to this later, You're not real sure. And this has always been kind of your thing. It's like, I just don't know. Like, what's really the difference? I can assure you this. If you're looking to other Christians to try to figure it out, it's like, you know, uh, you know, are they, what difference does it make in their life? Are they still messing up? Look, we're, we're all still sinners. And we will all still struggle with sin because of that. But maybe they're, maybe you're, you know, looking at them and their lives, they just, maybe it's true that they're just not living in the freedom that they've been given. But it doesn't mean it's not theirs for the taking and that it can be yours as well. It could be that just one decision to begin to follow Jesus and to receive the grace that has been offered to you, it could send you, I mean, Who knows? It could send your life in a totally different direction. Relationships might begin to be restored. Marriages might begin to heal. Addictions might begin to be overcome. Because you can be set free from sin and death. And it no longer has to be your master. Would you bow your heads with me? And I want to give you an opportunity right now to say yes to that, to step into that freedom. It's a life-altering decision, but it's not necessarily immediate. Salvation, immediate. Life change is a process. It's choosing to live in the freedom that can now be yours. And so I just want to invite you right where you are, to pray something like this. Just say, Heavenly Father, I want to live that freedom. Tired of being bound. I know something's broken in me. I 
think maybe it's sin. I confess I'm a sinner. And I believe I need a Savior who has given me his grace and mercy. And I received that. I believe his name is Jesus. Would you fill me with your spirit? Would you change me from the inside out? Would you teach me every day to live in freedom in what is now true of me? I want to be identified with you. Sounds way better than the alternative. I give you my life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thank you.